and real life. Hello everyone. Hope you're doing well and welcome to this live stream practicing session number, I think number 55 or something with Beethoven all in the framework now of the Beethoven project. That's the project in which I'm going to record all solo works of Beethoven, 60 works in total, over 22 CDs and that those recording sessions will start in October. So in the preparation for that to be happening, I share with you the process on the go. So the journey to that moment. And so today we are looking into the uh, second piano sonata from Beethoven, obviously. And um, we're going to play the rondo, which is the last uh, movement of that sonata. So if you have missed some of the previous sessions, they are linked now in YouTube with hashtags, which make it easy to search for content you want to connect to each other. So if you click on the hashtag here, piano sonata number two of something like that, you should be able to find the other, um, well, live streams of practicing sessions or even recordings back uh, concerning the same sonata. So we doing all of that in the framework of the double beat theory, which is basically a theory um, that goes back to the 19th century of how people use their metronome like uh, we don't do anymore. So for instance, just to give a short introduction, if you are new to that fascinating uh, thing of tempo research, which is fascinating because those metronome numbers, which we disregard a little bit today, or not to say um, don't look at them at all, are actually the exact tempo indications of the people who lived in the time where um, these works were written. So. It's not necessary to look at them. We're not obliged to look at them. We're not, we don't own Beethoven or another composer, anything, but it's interesting to look at them because we come very close to those people. The only thing is, of course, they are very fast. So if you apply the double beat, for instance, for this piece, we have several metronome numbers by Marshallis and Czerny, uh, and they are all the same, in the same range. 132 is a common number they both have given. So if you have 132, you don't apply everything, the quarter note, we have one, two, one, two, and three, and four. It's a very basic way of beating time. And actually in the 19th century, you'll find a lot of uh, teaching uh, books in which they, and the teachers actually are teaching beating time like this in classes. So it's, we still do it and actually conductors do it um, still today. Uh, now diving into the fascinating world of metrical use of the metronome or double beat, that's for other videos. We are going to make some music, I'm going to say some people hello in the chat. And if you watch this as a replay, I'll put the time code at the top of the comment section so that you know where the music starts. Um, okay, so I'll dive a little bit here in the live chat which is not so easy, I see, because the computer is rather far away and I fear a little bit you will not and hear me correctly. So there we go. A lot of people joining, that's great as always. Dark is here, as always, nice to see you. Rastislav is a also, um, you come here a lot, which is very nice to see your name popping up. Pedro de San dos Santos, if I don't, uh, I'm wrong, that's a new name, so welcome here. Theoretically, theoretically musical, that's so difficult to pronounce. If you want to do it correct with your the theoretically musical, so sorry if I mispronounce your name. Oftentimes also here, great to see your name here. And Stefan is here, great. Anya is in the chat, as always. Anya is my wife, she's moderating the chat. Uh, you might see John Citron coming, he's a moderator too for the channel. So. Michael Walter from Germany, great to have you here. Sina from Gothenburg, photographer. So if you want to have nice pictures, he's the guy to go to. Tour Anne, always great to see you again. Daniel Schecker, I think it's French. Mm -hmm. Listening to this practicing session, drinking coffee and enjoying a rainy afternoon in Brazil. Lovely channel, thank you so much. Well, that's... I actually can visualize the way you're sitting there. So um, yeah, coffee is for, yeah, nice, nice too. So Julian is here from Bulgaria. Great, Garrett also. So 
I haven't been asking this for a long time, but actually what would be nice is if you just, as some people already did, just type in where you come from, because we actually, with the small channel as we are, reaching all corners of this planet with the live streams. And it's one of the reasons why I postponed a little bit of time, not only because it's more convenient for us here at home, but 7.30 here is, that seems to be a better time for some people. We just try these things out. So the live streams or the recording pra recorded practicing sessions take over as premieres then. So you'll have the chat uh, possibility there. They'll go on Monday and Thursday as we speak. But we're building the channel, rebuilding the channel with some other series of videos that are coming in the coming weeks. And perhaps, I don't know for sure, that the live streams on Monday may be transmitted to Tuesdays, but that's really not certain. So we're trying this out and certainly let Anya know in the chat what your preferred time is. 7.30 here PM works great also for our little family that we are with two daughters. One is seven and one is 13. The eldest one is a little bit nervous, Sophie, because our exams start tomorrow. So, but we can change and we can have, actually have also two different hours. So that's all for um well we do whatever we want here on the channel we as a community so to say that's the great thing about having control of the things we do so now let's dive into the uh, hello susan see your name pop up in the chat orlando florida great um i guess it's not raining there perhaps it is but i see florida as a sun sunny place so anyway let's dive into the music as always i will play it for you the piece if I'm I've been studying that as is the case for this a major sonata which is a fairly new sonata for me I mean in terms of really practicing in a way to record it or to perform it is something different than just playing through it once in a while if you feel up to so this last part there is a lot to say so I will play it for you as well as I can it's all in the preparation so don't um, count me on making some mistakes. I share things behind the scenes. I'm opening my kitchen for you, so to say, um, which I think is, well, everybody should, every musician must do whatever he or she wants to do that with that. But I can see from your reactions also that um, this sometimes is kind of inspirational, perhaps I can call it like that to you. So I don't mind opening that and sharing my mistakes and my stupid things, perhaps that I say sometimes, why not? Uh, it's all about sharing and learning. That's what we're all about here. And I think that's a great thing that YouTube enables this. So this Rondo is a fascinating piece. I don't know if you know it very well. I don't think it's one of the most popular Beethoven pieces, but it's the A major sonata. And actually the complete opus two is fascinating music. It's unbelievable. I've said that last uh, practicing session, but let me repeat it. These three sonatas, is mind-blowing if I had the opportunity when I just had the clavichord for playing Mozart for I think Bach and Mozart were my composers to go because Beethoven I was not even thinking on trying that on the clavichord back in the days I mean we talk about 2010 2011 and so after I've been playing played a lot of Mozart for two years I was thinking, well, why not try some Beethoven sonatas? But yeah, because Beethoven, well, he wrote his sonatas just after Mozart died. So if Mozart works great on the clavichord, why not try some Beethoven? And it kind of worked, but I remember still very well the shock I got just stylistically, also technically in a way. So Beethoven opens in these sonatas so many new worlds and Every part, every movement of those three sonatas is a new world. It's unbelievable how much creative energy he put into that music, changing every part, every movement, um, yeah, into a completely new universe, and that he kept doing his entire life. And so I always wondered what Haydn, because these sonatas are dedicated to Haydn, what he would have said of start from that, just receiving them, playing them through. And then Haydn made his last, his last sonata, probably to, I don't know, to prove to the world that he um, 
I don't know. It's it's kind of symbolic there, Beethoven having lessons from from Haydn and so on. And so if you compare compare that to other works that we have been practicing on the clavichord, and actually yesterday I've been recording those pieces, two variations, and the Sonatina Sonata, Opus 49, number one, uh, the stylistically, so the variations with these sonatas, it's a completely different world. Um, the sonata variations, it could be Mozart, works perfect on the clavichord. These sonatas, they're opening something new. So let me just try this for you, and then we go a little bit more into detail. As always, we try to um, have these live streams finished in about an hour, but um, 30 minutes of music explaining something, going through my thoughts, share that with you, and then I dive into the live stream. If you have something on your mind that you really would ask me, you would not like to ask me, uh, of course, especially concerning this movement, or uh, just in general, do, please do so. And if I miss your question, Anya will make notes for that and she will come down stairs and share that with me so I can answer that in the, at the end of the live stream. So if you don't have time to stay, don't worry, there will be a replay uh, of this uh, live stream on the channel and most probably I will address your question at the end. Okay, there we go. It's a very difficult beginning with a slur that kind of need to be played rhythmically and then you fall into a rhythm which is really weird. Uh, it's much slower than you go from Actually, 30 second notes, 16th notes, triple 60, um, a triplet and 16th, and then 30 second notes, and then you fall back in an eight note movement, which works great. It, but it's a kind of weird. So there we go. <laughs>
Okay, so I hope this wasn't too much of a shock. John is also here, I see. Ethan Miller. So great to see all of you here. So this must be perhaps a little bit of a shock if you're used to another kind of performance and uh, what this double beat tempo does of, with this particular piece, this sonata, it's, it's, a, it's a huge sonata. So instead of something like 20, 25 minutes, this is a work I believe is scheduled for the CD recording. Uh, timing isn't here, but I think around 38 minutes or something like that. So this is also from this aspect of length, Beethoven made an impression. Um, by the way, all these sonatas, also from Mozart, they become much more, I mean, with some weight, so to say. So it's not just a piece that you get rid of in 15 or 18 minutes, it becomes 27 minutes, for instance. So it's really a piece that has some gravity. Um, this rondo is described by Czerny by Mesic Allegro. So of course, what, does, what that means is up for debate, but Mesic Allegro is kind of, yeah, Allegretto, not too fast, it's, it's joyful. If you see the, the the way Czerny describes Allegro, he gives an example in his opus 500, which is his pianoforte school in part three, so zum Vortrag, which means uh, about performance practice. You, he gives, if I'm, I'm quoting now from memory, nine or 10 or even 12, I don't think, but a lot of description what Allegro can mean, and he starts by sehr ruhig, so very, very uh, tranquil, very, very, I mean, not fast, it's just easy. Now, easy is not the right trans uh, translation. Ruhig means calm. So that's, so, mesig allegro, yeah, what does it mean? Luckily, we don't have to think about it because he gave his own metronome marks. I played more or less in 132, I hope. Let me know if he didn't. Um, but he gave also 144, so if you think, well, I feel it a little bit faster, yeah, then we can go for 132 to 144. And playing it in double beat, I often say that it's not, it doesn't mean that you have to stick exactly to the metronome mark from 
written by, given by Czerny or Moslos or whoever, but it creates an atmosphere, it creates a kind of new, oftentimes new um, idea of the piece, a new message that the piece gets, and so you stick around that idea, and if you can go a little bit faster, a little bit slower, but you will see that those metronome numbers often are in the same range. So for those, we, we often think today, or we are taught with the idea that tempo is something really individual, which in a certain way it is, but once the composer in those days had um, given his musical idea a kind of notation, apparently for those people back then it was rather clear, and I mean a professional level, because there was a complaint as well. The metronome wasn't, uh, the, or the pendulums didn't came there for nothing, so there was kind of confusion. But I mean, the people who really knew what they were doing on that level, uh, there seemed to be a kind of, uh, yeah, certainty, remarkable certainty with which they pointed tempo, tempi. And Moschus and Czerny, both of them, uh, are the best example you can take because they metronomized the whole uh, entire work of Beethoven, more or less, also, also Mozart, completely separate from each other. And those tempi are remarkably close. And if you go later, von Bülow, for instance, made his own metronome numbers for Beethoven and other works, and they, he is also close. So there must have been something um, that was not so individual as we think today. And that's interesting. So this is a really difficult uh, movement because of the different rhythms, it's certainly at the beginning. So also only at the beginning. So is it necessary to really rhythmically hit those, that run in the way Beethoven describes, mm, I don't think so in this particular case because he starts in 16th, goes in triplet 16th and then goes in 32nd now. So, so he apparently, I think, wanted to introduce the movement of the piece in a very gentle way. Um, later on, he, he uses uh, uh, different kind of note values and with left hand eighth note. So I think there it's necessary to at least try to match um, the left hand as exactly as possible, but still here you have to match or you have to introduce a tempo, whatever tempo you take, I think from the first bar onwards. And it's so delicate and it's so difficult because once you are here, your tempo for the whole movement is set and it starts here. That's really not easy, so uh, it needs practice. Uh, and a lot, I, I practice it typically by playing it, but also, uh, I mean, if I don't play, if I'm not sitting at the piano, just thinking about your rhythm, because this is something you really need to match. You open the movement by that, so it needs to be very secure. And then the last thing about this first bar, I introduce a little bit of pedal. It's not indicated and Czerny, I mean, I refer a lot to Czerny, it's not my God, so to say, but um, he was so close to Beethoven, he wrote so much about it. So it's, it's very inspirational to have you guided by him. I mean, imagine you, you could take lessons from Czerny, <laughs> wouldn't you do that? I mean, he has given us information, so that's the reason why I refer to him a lot of times. And, but here is, well, this arpeggio, it could use a little bit more of color. If you don't, if you don't use, it's possible, but it's. I was a little bit behind with tempo. And then the only thing you need to do is sing, and in the right hand and the left hand have this counter voice. piano sometimes feels a little bit too advanced. On the clavichord it's really easy because you, you have this left hand perfectly balanced with the right hand. 
Um, here you have to work on that. It's actually on every pianoforte. It's very, it's very str strong here. <laughs> is in the right hand. Don't be afraid of exaggerating. As long as the left hand is just gently proceeding its movement, so just not hold back in the left hand. The rhythm, the movement should be, it's a gentle piece by the way. The middle section of course is of a huge contrast with that, but other than that this is a really gentle piece walking in a sunny spring day you know, and on this old paintings, and then I'm actually thinking on paintings of early 20th century, so the, the ladies, and 19th century ladies with the umbrellas on Sunday in the park, that's this kind of atmosphere. So, but someone is telling a story, and that's of course the right hand, that's the opera singer. All these sonatas, they remind so much of opera pieces. So do sing there, make your story, I would say. But the, the lovely ladies with the umbrellas, they are continuing their walk, that's the left hand. So it's something like that that pops up in my mind when I play this. So here with the Sforzando, you see that the lady's a little bit looking to the man who is who's telling the story, a little bit interested. So they wait a little bit, but not too much. What's so nice here is the, the upper voice. difficult because Beethoven ends his motitari ram with a bow so he expects you actually to to have a little bit of articulation here but how to do that it's I didn't I haven't figured it out on the clavichord again this is no problem this is not written for the clavichord you can play the sonata on the clavichord the middle section the largo mm, not so much but this still works on the clavichord uh, but it's very difficult though, but it's not written for the instrument. You can you can feel, you can tell there are something, some very pianistical things in it already. But uh, on the clavichord, this is really easy. So gently bring this A to the G sharp without playing it legato, really legato. figure out how exactly I'm going to do another piano. Perhaps using a little bit of pedal here. Yeah, just one more thing on that because yeah, there's a lot to say about it. So I could, you could say, well, just play it legato, then, then end of problems. But you, and it's done often like this, and certainly with a little bit of pedal. Play it a little bit softer, play it legato, use a little bit of pedal, that's that's a trick you learn in conservatory. And it works, but it kind of changes the original idea, I believe. Those motifs are framed with this bow. Not only to give impulse to the heavy beats, but to, to align them with each other and to make sure that you hear this. like this with uh, um, eight note triplets 
Certainly, that's that's you you cannot emphasize that enough. That's ta 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 ta, ya pa pa pa. It's like like a declamation, yo. I hope that's correct English. And then starts a story, completely different. So here you take your time, I think. Left hand, right hand, and just end the phrases. Um, sometimes with a little bit of, yeah, you know, I wouldn't say that's rubato, but give time to the sentence. Dolce. a little bit articulated there is no bow here not saying that every every um, uh, you know group of notes without a slur shouldn't be played legato it's not true but here in that time it's before 1800 still 1793 four five something like that I would say the chance is really big that Beethoven wanted you to play this a little bit articulated so give this give these tones a little bit of more quality than just you to make these differentiations those are the important notes so without changing the tempo you hold the note a little bit and you you don't, you don't run but you catch up with time and it's allowed you, you can, can do that because left hand our girls with the umbrellas they stop walking you sit on the bench now and so you have more time that's all the thing. And also uh, something like that. It, I think for me it's impossible to play it, play it really rhythmic. So it's young. Repetition. something new starts in the left hand. to see how Beethoven takes this music suddenly in a completely other direction it's like leaving the picture the image of the sunny park with the ladies and umbrellas and the young guys telling stories and making impressions and just turning the camera to another thing starting from the same um, kind of movement kind of elements but suddenly you are in a new world here you have the left hand that has a clear base that you want to emphasize as a kind of counter melody with the B always repeated. Difficult is also on the Viennese piano, I would say certainly, because it, the action is so much harder to control yet uh, than on a Steinway where you can lean in the keys a little bit and, and make smaller movements. Um, but once you can control that, the, the piano gives this very fine, thin sound that's very present, but you need to you need to keep it up for a while, so it ends pianissimo. It ends certainly pianissimo, and it starts not for the dolce, so the whole section is really re dynamically, I would say, on the uh, quite reserved, so no, re really modest. And there you have the melody, it's coming out, so it's still, someone is still singing, it's making its case, but now it's capturing this movement of 16th note in the left hand, and there are darker clouds coming on so and you will see left hand takes us to 
kind of rhythmical pulse and suddenly suddenly there is again the slur that introduces the piece again it's wonderful it's a tricky passage here but wonderful to play actually <laughs> So now there's something else. perfectly balance your hand here but that's even that's difficult because you have upper notes and 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 wide notes and then you go again so then then the piece starts again all these different parts you have to be able to grasp to, to build a balance to build to build a unity so to say and the unity here is, is your tempo, it's your movement. So again, regardless of what tempo you take, it's a foundation and that, that brings everything together. And so whatever tempo you take, you, it should enable you to continue this movement without compromising too much. And then comes, of course, the storm. That's uh, not a storm in the sense of rushing and being outrageous, it's kind of inner anger that you out it's 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 really it's 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 a kind of introvert anger here we're really powerful and the staccato notes so the triplets are all indicated staccato with some slurs with and the slurs have a swazando sound so really harsh sound which worked great on the pianoforte and um, if you heard if you've heard its piece before much faster then this certainly will need some time to adapt. But once you have done that, when you go through that, listen to it a few times, it becomes really powerful. One of the tempo indicators also for the piece are exactly here. So you have, for instance, the triplet in the right hand and the left hand, you have uh, so a dotted eighth note with 16th note. So the 16th note should come right in between. So. So I'm not saying that you cannot play it a little bit faster than I do, but there comes a limit in which the triplet and the dotted uh, 8 note 16 becomes actually equal or are actually not really um, uh, audible. We, um, uh, how would you say that? Uh, uh, be, uh, possible to disconnect from each other. And once that happens, the notation fails or the tempo fails. I think it's always the tempo then. Beethoven who fails? Mm, don't think so. So if you ever run like run like that, you may have to make something. the tempo perhaps I increase the tempo here a little bit so you could say well that's not allowed I I do think that's allowed I mean we talk about a, a modest change I even don't know if I do that just so let's just check it might be it's interesting for me to know well actually I'm below Czerny's tempo now it's 62 so but 
if you feel uh, like increasing this tempo, let's, let's imagine you start in, in double beat 132, so single beat 66, and you'd say, well, I feel this at 72 or 76 even. I don't think that's a problem. Stylistic, it's never a problem. If you really feel doing that, yeah, you should do that. Um, the only thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say is, is we try to reconstruct what might have been possibly in Beethoven's head when he wrote his music. So from the notation, there is no tempo change indicated. So uh, meaning that everything you do there to match the idea you have in this music should be connected to the movement you had before. I personally try not to change the tempo here. But again, it's possible. And sometimes it works because if you just increase the tempo a little bit, a tiny little bit, your audience will feel a kind of uneasiness because you introduce them to a tempo that's really steady before. It's a kind of movement that's in all these classical pieces. You have a movement that just goes on and on. And then suddenly there is a little increase. So everybody will feel this tension. And most of your audience will not even know what's going on. So if you can control that up to a level that you can bring it back at the end, then you have a really powerful effect. Um, really powerful. Because at the end, when you bring it back, I cannot demonstrate that because for that I need to record a piece or to play a piece from, 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 from the beginning. And you also have to feel that movement from the beginning. You need to be focused really, really well. But if you bring it back, the moment you bring it back, everybody will feel that. And in that moment, there is a kind of relaxed feeling that you get from that. That's unbelievable. And you, the only thing you need to do is, as in this case, from let's in single beat 66, you increase the tempo to 69 or 72, and you're, you're good to go. And then you come back, and then suddenly it feels, oh, there, we are back. So, um, and, but you don't need to do that. By definition, this is really powerful. So, so on its own, it's, it's anger. And if you speak about tempo, it's you cannot create this mood by playing it much faster. The staccato, and be dramatic, be your own. You know, uh, in Dutch we say dramaturg, you know, you, you have to build the scene for the... Also here. So that's, that's a huge contrast, which makes the piece fabulous. But you have to build this anger here. And you do that by, by, I think, as I think for now, by giving much emphasis to the, to the staccato eighth note. So, okay. I look at my clock and it's 20 past eight. Can you imagine that we're talking 50 minutes on this piece without your introduction, maybe 40. So the A major sonata is incredible and um, that's one of the great things for this Beethoven project guys that I just can go through all the pieces or Beethoven uh, you could say well you have to but that's a privilege and I, I go through them much deeper certainly thanks to these live streams also than um, and, and, and much more focused I, I've seen that with the recording yesterday of the two variations that we did on the live streams last two or three weeks some uh, re pre-recorded sessions they actually um, 
are so ready for recording that. Uh, it's unbelievable, this focus. Okay, I dive into the chat here with you a little bit for some minutes, if there is something up to your mind. I see Emmy in the chat. That's great to have you, Emmy. I was expecting yours, of course. Um, so much power, see why? So what would this mean? Yeah, it's power. That's actually what it is. And increased tempi will never make up for the things you want to have. And remember that because it's true. I see this this often. If you, if you play a piece and you you say there's something missing, but most musicians. I also do is trying to increase the tempo a little bit. And you see, then suddenly things go better. You feel, but after five minutes, you feel the same thing again, because the tempo doesn't solve the problem. It's an accentuation, it's an articulation, it's in, yeah, bringing everything in balance. Okay. Easy or not easy, yeah. No, if you play it like this, John writes, easier, not easy. Uh, technically, of course, this is easier. I mean, there is no discussion about it. Uh, this piece in single beat is impossible, I think. It's one of those pieces that are really impossible. We've gone through the first movement, uh, the fingerings of Beethoven, remember? That's really, really impossible. Uh, you have to do tricks and then even then. But uh, technically, it's more difficult. But... Uh, uh, okay, Paris, Finn, maybe you choose the wrong tempo if you had to increase the tempo. Yeah, but that's true. I mean, in general, regardless of what tempo you cho choose, and we are, I mean, I'm focused on the metronome numbers, and I think I want to really understand them. But what, regardless what tempo you choose, you have to bring everything in balance. Fingering is one of those things. You cannot use Chinese fingering. We we're going to make some videos on that. Chinese fingering and single beat, this makes no sense. It does really, for me, even strange things, which make sense after a while, but um, which are difficult to actually execute in, the, in even the double beat tempo. So everything is a balance, and you need to balance things out clearly. Yeah, Rusty's left lots of information to process. That's great to read. So um, for me as well. I mean, it seems all to be prepared, these live streams, perhaps, I hope, I mean, but still I'm actually sharing my initial thoughts, still forming my thoughts and going deeper and change things. So it's all on the go here, together with you. Um, yeah, John writes about Barry Cooper saying that the triplets should be to play separated from the dotted notes, which is unusual for Beethoven's time. It both systems were there. It's often times very hard to say. Like for instance, um, in the Moonlight Sonata, if you um, uh, you have there the melody, the triplets, and 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 the, the accompaniment, of course. Those triplets needs to be, in my opinion, played, played separately from the from uh, from the triplets. But you have sometimes, and yeah, it's something I have to dive into. And frankly, it was Lorenz Garden who pointed me to that, saying you have both practices. We're going to Lorenz, by the way. If you have questions, I will post some thumbnails on the community tab on YouTube. It will sh show up in your feed uh, from YouTube. If you have questions, um, I will take them with me. Andre is here. Yeah, Barry Cooper asks Doug is is yeah considered one to be to be one of the Beethoven scholars today. He does he did great work, but you could criticize him for many things, I think, as well. But that's fine. I mean, you can could criticize everyone. We should be critical to each other. Yeah. Okay, guys. I'm just not running downstairs, so I think you've I had a good time in the chat. I'm just scrolling back now. It's actually great. See what you, yeah. I see Costas has, has given you uh, some reactions. He is here at the moment. It's relaxing very. It's actually upstairs. So relaxing. You can hear him if you. Uh, if yeah, we be very silent. So. We have had a great time. So Kostas, for those of you who are relatively new to the channel, he's our Greek friend and composer. He does some wonderful, wonderful things. 
and he's talking about an opera with a real new libretto so there are some things happening there and we definitely have to play some of his music because he is uh, composing piles of music and if I don't catch up with his music I will there will be meters of music waiting for me but yeah the Beethoven project has taken us so much time and we can we meet Costas? Well, I ask him, Costas, would you mind coming downstairs? He is a, such a shy person. <laughs> and now Anya is forcing him to come down. So this is an unexpected, unexpected ending of the live stream. Yeah, Cooper Duck is, uh, re is Barry Cooper is a living uh, Beethoven scholar. So I introduce the maestro here. <laughs> So there he is. Anya, can you put the camera a little bit higher? Because uh, yes. no. oh, well, sit here. you can sit here and then, then this bench is it's crashing. So we're sitting on the same bench now. Then he's a tall guy. I am actually the camera's there, but here you can see yourself. You see. Yeah, he's a tall guy. And still we fit. When we met first time last year, I picked you up at the airport and the first thing you said, you remember? No, that, that's long. That was two, two and a half years. Two and a half years. There were some yeah. videos on that where Costas is composing live. But the first thing you said to me was, you yeah. look much taller than you yeah. are on videos. The first thing, yeah. Yeah, so meeting finally someone, yeah, you look much far taller than. Uh, that was also so someone in chat, Westport, your Instagram name is Scots. Nice. I hope you like them. And uh, I don't know. You're playing them, I hope. We're going to upgrade our website, mm -hmm. level up our website and putting your scores a little bit more in a better way. Nice. So Emmy is applauding for you. Well, thank Doug you. Doug says, do what time? Doug, are you really thinking I'm going to let my instruments destroy by this Greek concert? <laughs> Another joke is when he comes here, so Saturday he came, and my mother actually picked him up because we had an inauguration of an organ the same moment. So, and my mother said, "Yeah, if you want to play something, he said, are you kidding me? We will kill me, but that's yeah. actually not true. I will not kill you, punish no, you no. perhaps." Yeah, yeah. And the first thing I told you, I told him again is, "Wow, I have forgotten how tall you are." That's right? exactly yeah. true. Yeah. No, actually, you said I, you, 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 you. Are yeah, taller I have forgetting. Than, yeah, yeah, I have taller forgetting than how tall you are. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and actually, Costas kind came to here because we are always having in the chat. In the previous times, when we had a five p.m. or live stream, uh, you were talking about cooking, and I was always saying that Anya was such a good cook, and he said, oh, "Come and yeah, find out." Yeah, Yeah. So, very lucky to be here with my good friends. So I'm sitting here next to the new Beethoven. Eh? Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Think so. Costas, if I compare Costas to Mozart, he says, listen, we are both Mozart and I are standing at the red light, but he is sitting in the Ferrari and I'm on my bicycle. That's how you feel. And that's a good feeling. Yeah. But you, you, you made some wonderful wives and they deserve much more attention than... Thank you, thank you. And thank you very much. You and know. share a lot about your opera. Make your YouTube channel and sh make us we, we part of see. that. We will see, yeah. When it's something finalized, we will uh, we will make. Okay, okay, guys. It was nice to have you here. Let me leave the the camera so we can wake. So I was about to close that together with you. No, no, you can close. It's you. So that was Costas. <laughs> so you will leave tomorrow. So we had a nice time. And actually, we're, yesterday we were recording the Beethoven together. I, uh, Anya was upstairs with the kids and Costas was a recording engineer. We had a great time. About one hour and 40 minutes I played. Yeah. And he was totally exhausted and it was really, I was really fired up because if you record, you get this much of energy. It's so essential to do that. I could do this my whole life. Hopefully I, I will. And if he was great, he will see in the videos. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Guys, thank you for being here. I hope this was helpful. And so on Thursday, I have another live stream or pre-recorded session I will see. And as always, as I said at the beginning, time can change. We will keep this hour for uh, for now. 7.30 is a good hour here. 
uh, but don't hesitate to reach out to me and um, if that doesn't work. So on Thursday, live stream all premieres. I try to have the Mondays for the live streams and try to have a live stream on Thursday as well. Once we have the studio, things will go hopefully easier. So thanks for being here. Thank you from, and thank you, special thank you for my patrons. A lot of you are in the chat. So you really help me build all of this. And if you haven't heard from our Patreon community, there is a link in the description box. We appreciate if you would just take a minute and go there. And there are several tier levels. You can see that. And actually we're building there a strong community. I'm posting more and more things also on the Patreon page. So things that I find that come just across my desk or my computer or here on the, on, on the piano make some behind the scenes recording talking about what's going on also for the business we're trying to make out of authentic sound it's a beethoven project so i can share actually a, lot, a little bit more actually much more on that uh, patreon page so if you have some time appreciate you visiting that okay that was it have a nice day um and we see each other very soon again